this is all working out correctly. Folks should be able to hear the audio and me. As far as I know, there are no people in the room. Alright, I had said 8 o'clock. It is almost 5 past 8. Nobody's around. Uh, but I will start playing in just a bit. Just so there's something for the archive. Something that doesn't involve me on camera with my shirt off. No camera tonight. I'm not camera ready. And I'm 
exhausted. So I'm drinking my last cup of coffee and I'm going to play Dracula 2. Uh, let me go attempt to drum up some more uh, people. Uh, so welcome to what I'm lazily calling Tom Plays. Hopefully the game audio isn't too loud. Let me turn that down just a little bit. There we go. Now my voice should be overpowering the lovely Konami strains as being echoed through the Famicom Disk System. Mac, but if I had a Famicom disk system, it probably wouldn't work. I have to understand that's how things actually work now. Awesome! Um, tonight, I'm going to be playing a little bit of uh, Dracula 2 Nori no Fuen, which in the U.S. was actually um... Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest which gets kind of a bad rap these days um, it is very very different from the previous installment for the Nintendo Entertainment System uh, it was also a Famicom business I 
going to like this game because it's different. And I grew up with this game, so in addition to the overwhelming nostalgia for it that I feel, there's also the time I've spent with it as an adult and knowing the context of games at the time and what they were likely going for, I have a, a great respect for this game. It still has loads of flaws and it by no means, no means, uh, should be considered like a classic or anything like that. And I just stopped the music there briefly. Uh, it's a good game. It's not a great game. It is highly problematic. Um, and we're going to go ahead and start um, a playthrough. We're going to play a little bit of the game. And I'm going to talk about why things in this game are how they are. Uh, there's been plenty of people who have just gone over the things they like and don't like about it. Um, I'm going to talk about why this game is. Because that's really my, my kind of focus on, on these kind of topics. I like to talk about why games came to be, why they are the way they are, and also what they mean to me. Uh, so this is less of a, a review and more of a kind of historical and autobiographical stream. Um, I don't think anybody's listening, but let's press on, shall we? <clears throat> Coffee. All right. Take down the slide. Actually, no, I don't want to take down the slide. I just want to bring forth the emulator. There we go. All right. This, actually, what I'm going to do is attempt to switch microphones. Let's see if this works out. Ha, ha, ha. Test, test, test. Nope, not going to do that. Okay. All right. Okay. Going to use that microphone, because why not? All right. The best part about nobody being around is I can stall my butt off. Aw, oh, yeah. I'm ridiculous. I know. I'm going to change the lock settings on my phone. So I can keep up with the chat. Most people when they stream, they seem to do one of two things, as far as I can tell. They either just have everything up on their computer, and they do everything up from there, or they have somebody else monitoring the chat while they play. That seems logical, right? Well, I don't have anybody, and I don't have Flash installed, because I'm computer hipster or something, and I don't like Flash. So I can't look at the chat on a computer. So I have the iPhone app up. And hopefully all of this is working the hell correctly. I can't make that too big, but I can center it somewhat. 
white pillar boxing. Sorry, best I can do. Actually, let me just go ahead and remove the slide altogether. There we go. That should look a little bit better on the screen. I hope. I'm gonna check one more thing. Nope, nobody's looking for me. They didn't think so. All right, so I got the chat up on my phone. I'm gonna bring everything a little bit closer to me. It's another reason why I didn't want to use the camera. So I could just stretch out and stream. Zoom. You'll notice something that probably doesn't look familiar to you here if you played the, the US version of the game, Castlevania II Simon's Quest, the one I grew up with. In Japan, it shipped on the Famicom Disk System. If you're not familiar with the Famicom Disk System, uh, Nintendo released an add-on for the family computer in Japan. That allowed people to play games that shipped on floppy disks. These games were less expensive than Famicom ROM cartridges. You could go to the store and put in a blank disk and write a game to it, take it back to your house and play it. You could even overwrite an older game. If you didn't like it anymore, you're done playing Metroid, bring the disk to the store and get some weird Super Mario game or something. Um, back then it was kind of a neat thing everything worked great and it let people play more games but in modern times this leads to a series of problems one of which is that a lot of the Famicom disk system floppies you find don't actually have the game uh, listed on the label because they could be overwritten with other data. And also, if you're lucky enough to come into a Famicom Disk System unit and a Famicom to plug it into, there's a good chance the belt that drives the... it makes the disk bin basically doesn't work anymore. Uh, there's kind of a neat sharp unit that had one built in that, that I want to get a hold of. It looks very interesting, probably very rare too. Could import it, but I don't have any money. Um, so a lot of games that we got in the U.S. that required obnoxiously long passwords originated as Famicom Disk System games, which provided the benefit of being able to create a profile and thus save your game right to the disk and pop it back up. Uh, the original Legend of Zelda uh, shipped on disc. Metroid Kid Icarus shipped on disc. The first two Castlevania games shipped on disc. Now, while there are numerous benefits from having a disc based game that you can write to, you don't have to deal with passwords, uh, there's kind of a new game plus concept here, too. I, I went through and played again just to refresh all my skills so I didn't look absolutely horrible while I played for you folks and after you finish it lets you start again with the timer reset and we'll talk about that with all of the stuff you had when you finish the game nothing else changes though you don't get any special new items in the world nobody really had that concept yet but basically, it gives you another crack at getting one of the three different endings. And I'll talk about those in a bit, too. Um, so later, I think I might show off all the items and whatnot. I'm basically going to show a brand new playthrough through the first dungeon, um, which are called mansions in this game. I'll explain everything later. Uh, right now, I'm just talking to the air. Haha. Uh -huh. Alright. It's time to make a new player. Uh, who the 
problem I have with this. I don't actually know how to stop entering a name. So that's my name for this playthrough. T colon A. Whatever. You notice my first character is Tom Down Arrow Down Arrow. Because I couldn't figure out how to stop. Alright. This game is not translated. Um, there are a number of bits that are in English. Most of this game is in the original Japanese. I don't speak or read Japanese beyond some standard phrases like Ohio and the ability to count to three and to say something's good or something stupid. That's mostly the extent of my Japanese. So I could not tell you what it says on the screen right now. Other than the fact that it means we have to take out the disc and flip it over. If you grew up with an Apple II or a Commodore 64, you might be familiar with this process. Since I'm not using a physical disc, all that happens is I push a button and things load. There are load screens. We're looking at one. This is the downside to having a disk based game. Some scenes have to load. This is telling me game start three lives in advance. And here we are. This should look familiar to anybody who played this game as a kid. Pretty much everything in this game is the same. Uh, with the exceptions of some of the music, the dialogue, and the ending looks a little bit different. Uh, Konami USA changed things around. We're going to take a quick peek at one thing uh, in a bit that may have been changed for the US version. I don't know, uh, but we shall... Uh, I will compare later. Maybe I'll make a video about that. I don't know. That's Simon. He's our hero, Simon Belmont. Simon moves around like this, there's his walk cycle, there's his jump. Simon comes pre-equipped with a whip. In Castlevania lore, it's called the Vampire Killer. Uh, in this game, it is known as the Leather Whip. This is Simon's status screen, something that didn't exist in the first game at all. The first thing on there shows how much time has elapsed. In game, uh, about four minutes pass for every second. If you're not in a building or here in the status screen, so we see it's like three thirty in the afternoon. Simon starts his quest at around noon. He's a lot like me. He rolls out of bed whenever he feels like it, and he's like, "Well, I guess I better go resurrect Dracula," which is the storyline for this game. Simon killed Dracula in the first game, but apparently doing so put a curse on the land and on his family. So what he has to do is round up four of Dracula's body parts plus his ring uh, from various mansions hidden across the Romanian countryside, put them all together and resurrect Dracula and kill him again. It was the late 80s. That's the best they could do for a plot. Most plots were basically someone was kidnapped, usually a lady, friggin' male game designers, and you have to go retrieve her. Castlevania at least had a somewhat different story, most of the time. That clock there uh, shows days, hours, and minutes. And again, about four minutes pass for every second of game time when you're not in the status screen or in a building. This matters for two things. One is that the faster you beat the game, you get different endings. There are three different endings. We're not going to see one here. I have a playthrough that I'm going to post to YouTube if you can stand looking at me with my shirt off for a little bit. Sorry about that. I was just testing things. Uh, where I get the good ending for the first time in my life. Because uh, my first playthrough, I got the the so-so ending. You can look those up online if you'd like. Um, 
but this was one of the first games that actually had variant endings on an 8-bit console. Pretty nifty. Also, this game has a day-night cycle. If you've seen the Angry Video Game Nerd video on this, you know it's kind of awful. Uh, suddenly the game just stops and it gets dark and the monsters get more difficult. And then day comes 12 hours later. In game, it's only about a few minutes. In this version, it goes rather quickly compared to the US version. We'll probably see at least one day night cycle change as we play. But it was kind of an interesting mechanic for the time. It wasn't implemented terrifically well. But we'll see that come into play. That's the other thing the clock represents. The in-game clock mirrors real time. So around six or seven o'clock in game, it gets dark. And then at six o'clock in the morning, it gets light. There's a few other things on the status screen that are important. Uh, next to the E there on the second row, that's my experience level. As I kill monsters and collect hearts, I get experience, another big change from the first game. There was no experience. The reason for that was there were no role-playing games um, affecting the design of other games. Once Dragon Quest came out in Japan, everything suddenly had RPG elements. Just forget about it. Um, no game type was immune. There's a tennis game for the TurboGrafx-16, the PC Engine in Japan. I don't think this game came to the US. It may have. But you go around from town to town, and in each town you upgrade your tennis racket, and your boss fights your tennis matches. Everything became an RPG. This is why Zelda 2 is why Zelda 2 is the way it is. Even Super Mario Bros. 3 kind of has RPG elements. You have an inventory, and you have an overworld map. It's not exactly like Dragon Quest or Dragon Warrior, um, or Final Fantasy for that matter, but it has those elements. You start to see more of them slip into games to varying degrees, and eventually we hit sweet spots, and it didn't become as important to have RPG elements in your game by the early 90s. In the late 80s, after Dragon Quest, gotta shoehorn everything in there. So Simon has experience. I kill monsters, I get experience, and eventually his L level goes up. Uh, what leveling does in this game is it gives you more hit points and makes you more resistant to hits. Some things are still instant death, like falling in water, uh, which kind of sucks. Can't swim. Simon is, I'd say he's hydrophobic, but that would technically mean he has rabies. He might, I don't know. Uh, so it's kind of good to do a little bit of grinding to level up. My heart count is below that. Uh, as I mentioned before, as I kill monsters and collect hearts, my experience goes up. Hearts also serve as ammunition for some sub-weapons, none of which I have right now. Uh, just like they did in the previous game, but their primary purpose is currency. I have 50 hearts, I can trade them for something. There are actually two items in this town that go for 50. I'm gonna go out and kill some monsters now. We'll also see a few things in this town. That last line there with the Japanese text basically just says, I have a leather whip. There it is. There are villagers and you can talk to them just like in a regular top-down RPG of the time. Of course, in a game like Dragon Quest or Final Fantasy, you talk to people and the majority of the time they tell you something useful. In this game, it's the exact opposite. People once thought it was a translation error that we got in the US version of the game, that all the villager states were terrible. Oh no, 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 no. That was intentional. I think they thought because it was a horror-themed game, or there was a curse on the land or whatnot, that people weren't going to be nearly as helpful as they are in other games. I are not really sure what she's saying here. What we got in America might have been different, but she's probably lying through her teeth. So one of the good reasons why I'm able to play this game in Japanese is that you don't need to read anything. 
this is one of those games where the text doesn't mean anything. I'm just hopping around right now. This is a church. And if I recall correctly, the church looked very much like this in the U.S. version. They might have removed these crosses. I'm going to go up into this building. Now, were I injured, I could talk to this lady. And after she says all that, she'd heal me. They might have replaced this cross with a stained glass window or something in the U.S. version. I need to take a look at that. Nintendo of America wasn't very um, high on religious references in their games. Ooh, I stood around too long, and now it's night. Awesome. You'll notice that when the nighttime comes, the townspeople go away and they get replaced by zombies. That's no fun. So I'm going to leave town and kill some regular monsters. Killing the zombies in town doesn't mean anything. This game starts you off in town. You can talk to people. You can buy things with the limited funds you have. And then you can leave town and start whipping monsters to death. And it starts to resemble a Castlevania game. Of course, there was really only one Castlevania game with a lot of variants at the time, so... It's weird to think, oh, they ruined, they changed the entire formula, the, the formula that existed for one damn game. So whereas in the original Castlevania you go through the hallways of the castle and towers and whatnot, and eventually Kill Dracula after killing a number of bosses. In this game, you wander the Romanian countryside, looking for Dracula's various parts. And you put them together. As part of that progression mechanic, there are a number of items to find. And since I recognize this is something I didn't really understand as a kid, I just thought, oh, let me go to the mansion and kill all the things in the mansion and get the body part and move on. What they seem to have intended here was to start the game just like Dragon Quest starts out. You start in town, you then leave town, kill a whole bunch of monsters, get a level, buy better equipment, and then go after the first dungeon. And in this case, the dungeon for the mansions. They all look the same on the outside, they're organized differently on the inside. Some of them have bosses in them, some of them don't. That's one of the mechanics that doesn't really work well for this game. Um, even a good RPG of the time, even a mediocre one, usually had some kind of significant obstacle in the dungeon to worry about. This game does not. You just typically go through the mansion, you locate your MacGuffins, you collect them, and you leave. There are two sub-bosses in the game. One is the Grim Reaper, who provides a dagger, uh, which all the daggers in this game are highly overpowered. Um, If you watch the other video that I will have up about killing Dracula with all of your stuff, you'll see me use the knife there. It's kind of demented. All right. Daylight come and me want to go home. The day night transitions are far faster in this version of the game. You'll notice that I have 60 experience, so I'm getting better by killing these monsters, and I have 130 hearts. I think I need 200 for the items I wish to buy in town. What I need at this stage in the game are Holy Water, which was a sub-weapon in the first game. In this game, they're not that powerful of a weapon, however, one of the most infamous obstacles in this game were false floors in mansions. There were also blocks you can destroy and 
false walls that they will help you locate. So, holy water is imperative. You have to buy or find all the sub weapons in this game. However, you don't lose them like you do in the first game whenever you pick up a new one. You have an inventory, you can switch between your sub items. I also want to acquire uh, the next whip upgrade, which is the Thorn Whip. A little bit more length, a little bit more powerful. You'll notice before it was taking me four hits to kill the werewolves at night. Once I get the Thorn Whip, I think it's only one or two. And I need to get something called a White Crystal. There are three crystals in the game. You buy the first one, and then you trade for the next two. Uh, the White Crystal allows you to see something in the first mansion. There'll be a, a false platform that I'll show you when we get there. And later, you get a Blue Crystal, which allows you to drain lakes. Pretty trippy, uh, in order to get to different areas of the countryside. And a red crystal, which allows you to summon a frickin' tornado to take you through a cliff wall. Japan. Um, so those are the three items you need to get. White crystal, thorn whip, and holy water. Uh, total bill on that is 200 hearts. So I'm going to grind to 200 hearts and talk a little bit more about the game. So this part of the stream might be a little bit boring. But after that, we will go after our first item in the mansion, which will be Dracula's Rib. Uh, so you can get kind of more of a feel of what this game is like if you've never played it before. And we'll talk more about the mechanics as they go on. I'm also going to talk a little bit about my relationship with this game. In the days of Nintendo, for one thing, there weren't that many games, um, particularly in the late 80s when the system was first finding its home in the U.S. And, you know, you're a little kid, you don't actually have your own money, so you can't just go to the store and say, I want a new game. If you know a young person who has like, an Xbox or a PlayStation now, or a Wii U, uh, just regular Wii. It's not like they have $50, $60 lying around all the time. They rely on whatever games they get. Um, this was a game that I recall specifically asking for and receiving. Um, wasn't that interested in the first game. This game was the newer one. Dracula, or not Dracula in the US. Castlevania 3 had not come out yet. And I watched a friend play this. I watched another friend play this. Then I got my hands on Nintendo Power and explained all the weird intricacies of the game. I was just fascinated by it. I like weird stuff. To this day, I like games that are a little bit different or offbeat. Um, and I think that's kind of reflective of me as a person. I'm a strange person. Uh, here I am literally talking to myself on the internet while playing a video game. Uh, I think at least the good news with this is someone actually might hear this after the fact. Uh, if you ask my sisters, uh, they will know. They will tell you all about how they've heard me talking to myself about various things. And that it is strange, at least with this. People can learn more about this game, learn a little bit more about me, and who well, knows, maybe down the line we can do something interesting with this. I know I'm taking some hits there, and that's not necessarily a good thing. What time is it? Uh, it's 1.30. I still don't have enough. It would be nice if I can get to 200 hearts before nightfall. Again, at nightfall, all the shops close, and you can't buy anything. The church also closes, which sucks. Um, and thus you can't heal. Now, I might get lucky. Um, not in a really good sense, because I'm playing video games on the internet. Ha ha. Uh, but I might get lucky and ding the level one before I actually go back into town, at which point my health will refill and I'll get additional health bars. That's... That's the stuff in the upper left, I'm sure. You've seen a video game before, you know how that works. I should probably go by the Thorn Whip now and heal up. 
Pulling the whip, I believe, costs 100 hearts. Ooh, okay. That's one of the major annoyances with this game. Whenever Simon gets hit, he gets knocked back. And that is not fun at all. And here we are with a nice load screen. These load screens only occur when Simon is entering a town or passing in front of a mansion. Ah, oh, hell. Well. <laughs> Nighttime it is. I'm actually going to make my way toward the church and the shop I want. Maybe I can just grind on zombies here. Now, I don't necessarily know if these are townspeople or if townspeople are just being haunted by these folks. There are sprites or tiles in the background here for these boarded up doors. I've always thought, even as a kid, that they should replace all the tiles with those locked doors at night because it looks like you can walk into the church but no you can't you can't now enemies drop three different types of hearts there's these half hearts here i have 190 now i have 194 those are worth four the smaller full hearts are worth two and there are big hearts that are worth either six or eight. I can't recall. We're not going to see any of those larger enemies, usually ones that take a few more hits. We'll drop those. Let's see. I'm almost there, uh, but it's only midnight, thereabouts. I have a little bit more coffee. I sincerely hope I'm not actually killing villagers. At the very least, daylight comes and... That is such a useful signpost when you don't read any Japanese. Of course, in the English translation for the NES, they're just like, go left for Vrad Graveyard, go right for whatever. Most of the names are kind of cheeky horror names. But because none of the hints make any sense. Oof, barely made that jump. Hello Belmont Physics. Even though nobody's watching right now, as far as I can tell. Or if they are, they're lurking and they're not saying hello in the chat. So please say hello in the chat! Alright, I'll finish that thought in just a moment. I just named level 1. My experience then resets. My level marks is 1. Level ups are permanent. Uh, so even if I lose all three of my lives and have to continue, I will still be at level one. My experience in Hearts will reset, though. When is it? It's almost three in the morning. Okay. Just a few more minutes and then it will be day. And then I can buy all my upgrades and move the heck on. So what I was going to say, even though nobody's watching right now, I plan on doing this on a fairly regular basis, and then exporting the streams to YouTube. Uh, my YouTube channel is Ralphus, R-A-L-P-H-U-S 469. Um, I will likely put a link to that in my Twitch channel somewhere. Um, I realize the numerical add-ons at the end are somewhat immature, but I can't always get the names I want, and I'm eternally 12 years old, so those are the first numbers that come to mind. I'm horrible. 
I will eventually give the YouTube channel a proper name. Uh, it'll likely be Nerd Nest Productions. I'm gonna go in here. These creepy looking dudes here are merchants. That is my whip upgrade to the Thorn Whip. I'm gonna go ahead and buy it. Now you see my whip is a little bit longer. That I believe means Thorn Whip. If not, it's whatever this whip was called in Japan. Uh, I'm not gonna try that jump. Oh, the stairs. It wasn't until Rondo of Blood on the PC Engine, a game that never came out in the US until the PS Vita and then Virtual Console. PS Vita and PSP. There's the white crystal. See, it shows up in the top row of my inventory. And, good part of this merchant. And by the holy water. So here's how these uh, item subscreens work here. The top row are primarily for Dracula's parts and ring, plus your crystals. You can only equip one of those at a time. The lower level is sub weapons and additional items. Um, I don't really consider the garlic or the laurels to be weapons. Uh, but they enable certain things to happen. Uh, the laurels give you some temporary invincibility. The garlic usually summons a creepy dude who gives you something. Uh, so you can equip one sub item and one, oh, let's call them key items. Yes, you could actually equip Dracula's parts. It's actually necessary in a couple parts of the game. There are also two items. Maybe I'll, I'll even show you later uh, what my other playthrough looks like. There are two items that are not equipable, uh, but they are kind of necessary for the game. Uh, one is a silk bag that allows you to hold more laurels and garlic. Mostly useful for holding more laurels. Um, there are a lot of slime pits in the game. You notice now, the during the day, the werewolves used to take Two hits, and I take one. This is why you upgrade your whip. It's just like buying a new sword in Dragon Quest. And in addition to the silk bag, there's a cross uh, dropped by a boss that's in all the games, but it's very different here. I can't remember her name. People want to call her Minerva, but I know it's not Minerva. It's the lesbian vampire uh, from traditional vampire war. So now we're truly setting out um, an alternate means of playing this game. Oh! Alright. I'm going to finish a thought from before. Uh, if I had to give the stream a rating, it would be like team for team. Because... When you're playing old games, there are sections like this that tend to be frustrating, even this early in the game. Um, I got hit by a fireball and got knocked back into water, which is a hallmark of the Castlevania series. That's no fun at all. I'm going to pause it, so I'm going to ignite right away. Because of things like that, because of the weird jump physics in older games, um, I might say something that you wouldn't want me to say in front of your children or your grandparents. Uh, so this, this stream is rated for T for Teen. I've been pretty good so far. So far. <laughs> I was going to say, an alternate means of playing through this game basically involves just striking out at the beginning, uh, probably picking up the white crystal, because um, if you don't do that, you'll have no idea what to do when you hit the mansion. You know, so I've just been working my way. Stupid skeleton. 
Ah. What the slime pits are we talking about? Ah. Oh, I'm working my way left to right, like you would many. Um, action platformer. Go from left to right because you're the good guy. This game allows you to go in both directions, though, as we saw earlier. I'll be able to just grind that whole area out. But you can start the game, you can buy your white crystal, you can come here without doing the grinding I just did. Uh, but I, I started playing that way because I really do think that... Uh, no, it's not a time. No big deal. I really do think that they intended for this game to be a lot like Dragon Quest, where you start out, you grind, you work, so... This platform that I'm standing on here, I've just entered the first mansion. I can only see it because I have the white crystal equipped. If I didn't buy that white crystal, or if I neglected to equip it before I walked in here, I would see nothing. And this is one of the things that vexed a number of gamers. They did not expect a puzzle in their action game. And I'm dead again. All right. I humbly request um, you folks bear with my poor jumping, particularly in this dungeon. I should have a dual shock hooked up, but I do not. Um, I'm playing with an Xbox 360 controller. Uh, Bob Mackie once described this on a Retronaut stream uh, as being like pushing a melted gummy bear. And I do apologize for what I'm doing right now. This is the annoyance of playing Simon's Quest, one of many. Some of the floors are false. Sometimes the planes will be false. Ah. So in order to make sure you don't fall through a false floor, you spam the holy water. This is not fun. But it was one of the only ways they could come up with to add challenge. They kept all the physics the same from the original uh, Castlevania or Akamaji Dracula. I have a dead end. Check this out. Oh, there's a book there. This book would give me some kind of hint if I could read Japanese. It might be bogus, I don't know. Trucking along, trucking along. I think I did my first playthrough. I think I had to continue at least once. Now, the Holy Water can be used as a weapon, as you've seen me do a couple times just there, uh, but it does as much damage as the original Leather Whip. Um, I don't want to say that you know, one has replaced the Vampire Killer, um, but. That's how it reads in game. You actually buy a new whip. But maybe it's like Air Force One. Um, ah. So yeah, false floor. I knew that one was there too, and I still jumped right through it. So far, this stream is very appropriate for small people. Maybe I'll try to keep it that way. <laughs> I'll label the YouTube video if uh, anything nutty happens. Half a heart. 
got a half heart. Why do I make that jump? Even in Japan, they refer to the funny way that Simon jumps. It's like he jumps straight up. Once you jump, you have no control over where he goes. He just lands. You need to jump straight up, jump to the right, jump to the left. That's it. Uh, contrast this to Mario from the Mario games. Ah! I'll make that jump eventually, I promise. Mario can break dance all over the air when, when he jumps and land wherever you need him to. And you kind of get a feel for how his momentum works. I didn't have any momentum, he just. Potato sack is how I've heard this described. Ah, the cat who did the scenario for Rondo of Blood. Ah! And later went on to produce Simply in the Night. Um, my two favorite Castlevania games. Oh, yeah, the Nature Soft Buck. I don't really like the other two NES ones, they're, they're difficult. And I never had a Super Nintendo, so I have no affinity for Super Castlevania 4. It's really nice. But it's not my cup of tea. I, I kind of prefer the older games. Um, I like those RPG elements tacked in. Hey, I made it. Okay. I'm going to keep spamming this because. Okay, there we go. Ah. Uh, so I heard the uh, the producer of Symphony that I refer to Belmont Physics in a video he made for uh, in Castlevania Chronicles, which is a remake of a I think it was PC88, uh, one of the many Japanese computers of the time. Can I get through here? Nope. Okay. Talk about fixing those Belmont Physics. Uh, for the reissue of the game. So I couldn't stand it growing up. The ease of this dungeon is really because I bought the phone with. Those spikes are not instant death, but they knock you back and you can kind of bounce on them. So you hit them, you have your invulnerability, you fall onto the spike again just in time, so you can kind of hop around like that. And, yes, your eyes do not deceive you. There's a merchant inside the mansion. Just like how in Dragon Quest, there's a merchant who shows up inside the dungeons. Fairly certain it directly references that. I really think the folks at Konami really just wanted to make Dragon Quest on its side. Instead of random encounters, you fight monsters just like you did in the first Castlevania game, but everything else is Dragon Quest with the exception of the difficulty of the mansions. They were trying. Everything was still new at this point. I don't begrudge them that. So what, pray tell, is this random merchant in the dungeon selling? The English translation of this reads, invest in an oak stake. I always found that kind of funny. Uh, invest usually... The connotation of that means, all right, I'm going to invest in real estate or the stock market, something that's going to have a return, it's going to help out here. Here, you buy an oak steak, it shows up as a consumable sub-weapon. Consumable. All the other sub-weapons in the game, you keep forever. Forever. The oak steak is one use. The laurels and garlic that uh, show up later. I think that's another book. Yep. Collecting these books does nothing. They're just hints, like the villagers did, and nearly all of them are focused. The laurels and garlic are consumable as well, but you get more than one at a time. The oak steak costs 50 hearts. You can only buy them within mansions. And you need one for every mansion. Ah! And I 
get to Sorry, very upset about that false floor. Ah, fudge. That's the continue screen. As I mentioned before, keep my level one, but I've lost all my hearts. I have all the equipment I had when I died, though. That's right. You die. <laughs> ah! Oh, false forms. This is a big heart I've mentioned before. Those are quite neutral. <sighs> Remember how I said before that time does not advance when you're inside a building? Yeah, that's kind of necessary. Uh, simply because some of the mansions, like this one, are just get kind of annoying with their false floors and occasional maze-like interiors. Get up there, Simon. I thought I was chasing, expecting. <sighs> this one in particular, it's the first mansion you encounter. And canonically, it's it's the one they lead you to. Because you you walk right and you end up there. It is the biggest freaking pain. When those bones hit the ground, those flames hit, those flames will harm you. Not the flame that occurs when you strike in it. No, that one's fine. But the bones this guy throws. Is he gonna throw a bone? No, let's see the end of They spark a little flame when they hit the ground. And that flame will harm them. Alright. So it's on this floor here, there's a false floor. So I have to spam. Holy water. Well, of course, the question some of you might be thinking about right now is how exactly was I to know that I'm on the wrong floor? How are you supposed to know that that is there? Well, you don't. It's... I think that's a mechanic that one could figure out eventually. Uh, if you're having trouble with this mansion. Of course, most people's thing is that they they get into the mansion and they have no idea how to get up to the first monster because there's no platform. And then they trek back to town, they buy the white crystal, and they just equip the white crystal because they have it, they figure it out. There's only three things you can buy in the direct path between the first town and this mansion. Um, and one of them is the Holy War. So I think people would eventually figure it out. I knew about it simply because I watched other people play the game and they knew it. They all little older brothers or uncles or whatnot. So I've reached the end of this mansion. Yay. For all that awful platforming difficulty, you're rewarded with the fact that you don't have to fight a boss. Now this is for some value of it. Ah, pardon me. I'm gonna say hydrated and caffeinated. A lot of people are upset that the difficulty just isn't there once you wrap your head around the platforming. This is a relatively small building. Um, and this is, they're just figuring this kind of thing out. So here's how we finish the dungeon. I've equipped the oak stake. I fire it like I would any other sub-weapon into that orb. It leaves a bag. 
And it now tells me that I have something. In this case, it is Dracula's rib. Dracula's rib is an equipable key item. I'm going to re-equip the holy water, and I'm going to equip the rib. When you're not moving or whipping, Simon holds the rib and it becomes a shield. It looks like a shield. Why his sprite doesn't just include him holding a bone? I don't know. I, I think it was necessary in order to convey that, yes, indeed, this is a shield. It protects you from primarily fireballs. Not that thing, though. Oh, no. Another one of those things shows up. I know. Fire. Here's that big heart that I was talking about. This is long before anybody thought of the concept wherein, hey, when somebody finishes a dungeon, we should totally just let them touch something or just end the dungeon and they can come out. Nope, nope, nope. You gotta leave. Even the first two Diablo games were like this. You, you could walk all the way through a mini dungeon in that game. And once you got to the end, you got your big chest. So you're done. Here's how this area looks without the white crystal equipped. No platform. Now that I can actually interchangeably do that, there's the platform. And that's gone. Confused all kinds of people of my generation. So now, I've already got all the whip upgrades and whatnot I can get to the left. I'm going to progress right from here. I've been streaming for about an hour, mostly scrambling. And I don't have video up on this one, so I can actually use this as raw game footage. It's going to look like butts, but whatever. Ooh, these dolphins take two hits. That's how you know the game is progressing. Ah! Bats! Bats! The bats travel in a sign pattern, much like uh, the Gorgon heads do. Uh, the Medusas, if you will. Ah! I always have that kind of thing. Everybody gets really antsy when you say, like, oh, Medusa heads. This one Medusa. No, within mythology. It's not actually ever existed. His eyeballs fly in the same sign pattern. But Medusa is of a species called the Gorgon. Ah! Kind of a Frankenstein, Frankenstein's monster kind of thing. The big green dude is Frankenstein's monster, not Frankenstein. Frankenstein's the doctor who made him. Uh, Medusa is a Gorgon. Not all Gorgons are Medusas. Squares and rhombuses. There's an interesting area over here. You notice that there's a whole bunch of stuff down there. Not really a whole bunch of stuff, but there's this whole area here. The holy water allows you to pass it. Uh, and then there's some more bricks over here. What's behind them? Uh, can I touch that? Yes, I can. That's a sub-weapon. It's kind of useless. One does not actually need to collect the Sacred Flame. But, hey, it's there. Ugh, spiders. I like spiders in real life. I don't like spiders in video games because they're usually annoying them. Notice how nearly all these monsters are just kind of playing on natural fears. People are afraid of bats and skeletons. And werewolves, spiders. Eventually the monsters get a little bit more interesting. A lot like those eyeball creatures. Who was it who said he was afraid of spiders? I've been watching a lot of YouTube shows in order to get in the mood for playing these games and talking about them. And I discovered a British kid, and 
I don't say kid to disparage him or anything. I, he's crazy young. He's like 18 or 19 years old. I'm not sure exactly how old he is now. I could probably watch uh, the episode where he talks about being three and do the math. Um, but he is really good. He's great with the video editing and very quick-witted. He's got a lot of that dry British wit that I enjoy. Um, yeah. He's a fun little guy, but he's a great spider. What the heck is this? You will often walk into buildings in towns in this game that just simply don't have anyone in them. Um, there we go. However, you can either break out the floor or the rear wall. And then you will find the rest of the building. Some of these folks have just boarded themselves up. This guy is just a townsperson. It's one of the few unique townspeople sprites they have. Not really unique, there's a couple. I used to call them swamis because I didn't actually know what that meant. Oh, I have plenty of hearts too. Yeah, what are the rewards for not dying in this game? Because they give you unlimited continues. I don't know if it advances the clock any. Uh, the punishment, of course, if you lose all three of your lives, you lose all of your hearts. And your experience counter resets. But, if you don't die, you can easily level, get more health, get more resistance. That makes the game a little bit easier in the long run. Uh, I think I dinged all the way to level 4. Um, there's a recommendation to grind inside dungeons because while you're in there, uh, you know, some more. Why not? while you're in there, time doesn't advance. Uh, the monsters will always be at the same uh, ability, no matter whether it's day or night. I don't think they're more difficult at night. I used to think they were as a kid, because everything else was, but that might not apply inside the mansions. But if you grind inside a mansion, uh, time's not moving, so you can easily up your heart counts and uh, hopefully level if you're lucky. This sprite is important. This guy I always thought he kind of looked like Davy Crockett because of the way his head looks. He is the guy you talk to in various towns to trade crystals. So I had a white crystal, and now I have a blue crystal. That's important. That's why I walked all the way the heck up here. I was actually kind of hoping this town had a church, but they have not yet found religion. I don't really understand the, the prevalence of churches in Japanese video games. Um, uh, while there are... Um, Judeo-Christian folks in Japan. It's not nearly as prevalent as Shinto or Buddhism. Um, just Japan, I'm not sure. Shinto is a big deal. Um, and you see, you tend to see a lot more shrines. Is there not a good sign for up in that town? Did I miss a damn door? Alright. <laughs> Let me finish my first thought, and I'll talk about that graveyard. Uh, so you tend to see a lot of churches in Japanese games. Oh, okay. This is the cat I bought the florals from. Uh, that's, the, that's the guy I refer to as the Swami. This might be the garlic guy. <laughs> yeah, I got a guy guy. You'd think this would be bad for business, holding yourself up in a building like this. There we go. Garlic. But yeah, don't really understand the prevalence of churches in Japanese games. 
Um, I think they figured with this game, it definitely makes sense because it's the Romanian countryside. It's, it's go around Transylvania, right? So of course there'll be churches in every other town. Why they aren't in every town, I don't know. Um, probably just to make things more difficult. Uh, I guess in a pre-industrial society, the only place you can go for healing is the church. And here's my one snarky comment for the entire stream. Maybe that's why the life expectancy was so low. Ooh. Four hits, even with the phone whip. So this looks like a dead end. But, all the graveyards in this game have that in common. You can drop a piece of garlic. You really want two places where it's works. All the graveyards. Merchant shows up. And they don't actually sell anything to you. They just appreciate the garlic. That, I believe, is the silver knife. So as you can see, that's a dead end. Now, in future Castle Baby games, one would see that and go, okay, later on I'm going to get an item that lets me, like, moon jump or something, and then I can get up there. Nope. That is a dead end. Elsewhere in the game, you encounter the other side of that, because, I don't know, Transylvania is round or something. And... You can actually end up back over here when you're much further in the game. So the whole thing's kind of on a loop. You need 47 experience. Okay. You only gain experience when monsters drop hearts, which is kind of annoying. It would be like if you're playing Final Fantasy and you don't get any experience unless the monster you're fighting happens to drop Gil or GP or whatever it is in the game you're playing. Um, right. But I can only get experience if the monster drops. Underground area here. Yeah, the, the Romanian countryside has all these weird little extra paths. This is the first Castle Baby game to really have branching paths, I think. The original Castlevania was mostly linear in order to make sure all the platforming worked out okay. This game just gives you its. Ah! Stupid eyeball creature. I'm sure it has a real name. I don't know. I'm pretty sure those those awful sticky things in uh, the mansion that were just going up and down with kind of like a leech. I think those are called bar sinisters. Possibly after the bad guy from Underdog. Simon Bar Sinister. I don't know. What's over here? Oh crap, it's a lake or a pond or something. Nobody in the game tells you that this is what you have to do. We either need Nintendo Power or Jeff Robin's How to Win at Nintendo Games in order to know to do that. This way. Yeah, they hid that mansion well. Why there's a mansion under the water? Just don't know. There's a real dead end. Made of bricks. Maybe if all works out in this mansion. I will hit level two. I'm not going to attempt that jump. There's that flame also. You can actually have killed this thing. Give it through a bone. 
and it lands. Fireball throwing enemies. See how that thing can kill you. Ah, bats. This is before games like knock enemies back too. I just literally played through this over the weekend. I don't remember where shit is. Ow. Well, I know I'm going the wrong way. Oh, I think I am going the wrong way. Ah! Alright. <laughs> Ah! That was like an ABGM moment right there. Now, to be honest, I can see why people don't like this game. It's kind of a product of its time. Um, at the very least, it's not the, uh, the kind of product of its time where it's incredibly racist or anything like that, but it's really just from an era where somebody thought Everything's got to be an RPG of some sort, and we can go from there. The original Legend of Zelda didn't have most of the mechanics that we really think of in an RPG, um, other than the inventory. Makes me wonder if Miyamoto was already playing Wizardry or whatnot. Zelda 2 has experienced random encounters in an overworld map. Okay, let's see what I gotta do here now. All these mansions have names. I couldn't tell you what they are. If they're near a town, the signposts in town will tell you their name. But not all of them have that. I'm fairly certain the first mansion I was in was Bram's mansion, like Bram Stoker. Okay, not false ball. No idea if I'm going the right way or not. I think this is the right progression for this mansion. I just simply don't remember that uh, thing with the horizontal spikes. Ah! Fluffer Nutter. You can tell I've been watching a lot of Happy NES puns as well. I really like the music in this game, although I will admit that the mansion theme is probably the worst track in the game. Um, I think the night theme uh, is best, and it's a little bit different here in the Japanese version, I think. Uh, U.S. version. This mansion is literally underwater. We have to drain a lake to get there. There's the other part of the dang lake. Another hint book. It's not, not useful because it's in Japanese. It's not useful because it's not useful. Again, like I mentioned earlier, um, people really did once think that there was just bad translation 
And that's why nothing in this game works. Dang it, I love the steak. Where's the guy with the oak steak? slow down there. There's enough going on on the screen. Things slow down. Ah, I didn't a long time. Alright. Sorry I'm quiet right here. I'm just kind of enjoying the intense whipping action. Dang, that's not bad. Uh, A lot of skeletons in this game. A lot of skeletons. That's how you know it's an RPG. Skeletons. Yeah, I know it seems weird that I'm checking the wall next to a void, but there is a mansion later in the game where the merchant is in one of those areas. He's like hiding inside the walls. What the hell? We just do it over here. And my audio just cut out. That's weird. Hmm. Might be a good place to stop then. Well, microphone's still picking up. I don't know why. Soundflower appears to have crapped out. All right, I've been going for about an hour and a half. Uh, that's how long I've had the stream up, and and I don't think anybody showed up, but that's okay because I will do this again, and this will be on YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for watching. I guess, even though nobody was really watching. Uh, plug this sucker. Oh, get these cans off my head. Not the kind of cans I want on my head, I'll say that much. These are kind of the basics of Castlevania II, Simon's Quest, or the version I was playing, Dracula II, Norai no Fun. Two used together. Again, uh, this game is very much Dragon Quest on its side. You start in the town, grind a little bit, go to the dungeon, get the item you need from there, earn currency, level up, buy more items, find some items. Most of the stuff you find isn't nearly as useful, with the exception of the Golden Dagger. And... You progress on from there. Uh, the late 80s, everything had to be Dragon Quest. That was the standard for Famicom games at the time. Uh, if you could get RPG elements in your game somehow, you did. And they didn't even think of them as RPG elements. They just said, okay, how do we turn this into an RPG? And then they'd do that. And that's how we have Simon's Quest. Uh, a game I love from my childhood, a game I still adore today, a game that is not without its flaws. It has loads of them. I like the fact that once you figure out the platforming in that dungeon, that first mansion, you're done. You you get the rib and you leave. Um, I do like that most of the mansions are set up kind of on a loop, so after you've finished, there's an easy way out. You usually don't have to backtrack all the way uh, because you have to leave. But still some kind of boss fight before uh, each uh, mansion's MacGuffin would be nice. Uh, the physics are still wonky. It's it's a Famicom era Castlevania game. Hard to complain about that. Um, yeah, uh, I think I'm actually going to pop in 
on the video now just to close this off. What's that do? Properties. Ah, sorry about that, folks. Still getting used to Open Broadcaster. All right, here I am on top of the game footage because I can. Thank you for watching. Um, you're likely watching this on the uh, YouTube archive. I will probably pull some highlights of this to put on my channel as soon as I figure out exactly how that works. And yeah, I'll be back doing this again in the future. I just hope some people show up for the stream because uh, otherwise it's just me talking to myself and I could do this um, on my own. Um, I would really like it if people showed up and sent me food, because I like food. And it would be kind of neat to just get a pizza in the middle of the stream. Hint, hint. Oh, uh, um, yeah, we'll do this. We'll do this uh, at some point again, probably this week. Maybe I'll play a little bit more of Simon's Quest. Maybe I will show uh, the run from the initial town to Dracula with all the items. Because, hey, I have a save file for that. I could do that. And then show everybody the best ending. And then that way I don't have to share the video where I'm shirtless and testing this. Uh, have a good night, everybody. And thanks for watching.